We're beginning a new and quite significant behavior pattern theme at this time. This is the issue of thankfulness. I would suggest that this issue of thankfulness actually serves as the greatest form of praise. There are a number of forms through which praise to God can be offered. Uh, prayers, singing, promoting and defending His righteousness, obedience, enduring trials, and also simple thankfulness. I think there's a significant amount of layered evidence throughout God's testimony that will emphasize how very significant thanksgiving qualifies as the greatest form of praise. Let's always remember our beginning, Adam and Eve. Admittedly, in their innocence, were not satisfied with the paradise they had been provided, choosing the serpent's invitation to more when they had enough already and lost so much because they couldn't appreciate the great advantages they had. Our own generation's particular challenge in this sincere performance of thankfulness is that extreme societal emphasis opposing the principle of thankfulness. When I was a child, <laughs> a couple of generations ago, the terms please and thank you were insisted upon by everyone, not just our parents and grandparents, but our teachers, neighbors, relatives, and even complete strangers would remind us to say please and thank you. Not only is this extremely uncommon today in our society, exactly the opposite frame of reference is promoted endlessly, demanding more, demanding what is expressed as our rights, uh, what is due us. This is the default and very ungodly perspective. Ours is the last generation of almost 6,000 years of that maturing serpent perspective. This is the generation that will prompt our Creator to reverse that accelerating global undermining of His righteousness. God will violently circumcise the collective hearts of mankind to permit the kind of godly understandings that can only come from a circumcised heart. The hearts of men and women are going to have to be crushed. The COVID pandemic has been mildly successful in this heart-diminishing progression, but this global pandemic is just one of the final birthing contractions that precedes what God defines as the time when he will end his prophesied silence like the painful screams of a woman giving birth and like the war cries of a charging soldier in Isaiah 42. We read, Yahweh will go forth as a mighty man. He shall stir up jealousy like a man of war. He shall cry, yea, roar. He shall prevail against his enemies. I have long time holding my peace. I have been still and refrained myself. Now will I cry like a travailing woman. I will destroy and devour at once. This is, of course, in the context of a very obvious and detailed prophecy of the introduction of the Millennial Kingdom. Uh, but it's interesting that the divine expression of, the, of this introduction of the restored Kingdom age is to be like the birthing of a child, and it's not an uncommon expression in Scripture. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, fairly familiar references, um, we are told, But of the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord uh, so comes as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. You are the children of light and children of the day. We are not of the night nor darkness. Therefore let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. Another aspect of the depth of this identification of the ending of that unrestrained acceleration of the serpent perspective being parallel to a birth is God's defining of the immortalization process to be experienced by the saints 
in just a few years as being born a second time. This is the issue that Jesus stressed to Nicodemus, uh, to be born a second time into a spirit nature as opposed to a flesh nature to inherit the kingdom. And he compares it to becoming like the wind. Another feature of the depth of this scriptural parallel is the new name that's given to the immortalized saints. This is what happens when a child is born. It's given a new name, and particularly the name of the Father. This is the family name that we're baptized into, that family name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So there's a significant depth and breadth to how God defines the introduction of the restored kingdom as the birthing process of a child. Those of us who have had children are intimately aware of the mental and emotional maturing that happens to us parents when our child is born. Uh, personally, I discovered a new and powerful love that I had never experienced before in myself. It was not at all the same as just watching other parents with their children. Part of that personal maturing is how a father and mother will commit themselves to nurture and protect their child. This will also be the case with the new age that will be born in childlike fashion. Jesus Christ will protect this new childlike age of which he is to be placed in charge. He will chain the um, four icons of the serpent, the dragon, the devil, and Satan, and imprison them in the bottomless pit. This will be accomplished through the education and enforcement of the kingdom laws and worship patterns that will be restored. In fact, this exact understanding is referenced in that same context in Isaiah 42, where we read about God ending his long self-imposed silence, uh, like the screams of pain when a woman gives birth. Uh, this is also in Isaiah 42, but dropping down to verse 21. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. Now, in the context of the restoration of the kingdom of God, we will see kingdom law restored. In order to protect that childlike new age from the unpleasant physical effects that are the consequences for pursuing the serpent perspective. That law will not be dismissed as insignificant, as is done in both the unenlightened and the enlightened communities today. For the sake of God's righteousness, kingdom law, what is often dismissed as, well, that's, that's just the law of Moses. <laughs> that law will be magnified and it will be made honorable. This will be how that serpent paradigm that rules mankind in all our global societies today will be chained and imprisoned so that this new childlike kingdom age can mature spiritually through the global education concerning the terms of our Creator's righteousness. Our primary point is that the current societal corruptions of what constitutes rightness is going to be dramatically changed on a global basis. This fairly minor pandemic humbling of mankind is just a birth contraction. What we surely all know, even if we've not personally experienced it, is that it's the nature of birth contractions that they accelerate and they get more painful as the birthing process progresses. One of the maturing corruptions of our societal serpent paradigm currently is this issue of refusing to respect the principle of thankfulness. We are taught from an early age to complain and demand to whine and protest and crowd chant and presume childish, tan childish tantrums are the effective and right way to get what we want. The children of men form complaining, demanding organizations 
called uh, such as labor unions. They form political action committees and protest groups. When I was a teenager, protest groups were organized simply as sit-ins for peaceful protests to disrupt procedures. Today, it's rioting and million-man marches and the slaughtering of innocents with automatic weapons in elementary schools, malls, and warehouses. The escalation of societal dissatisfaction is quite obvious. The huge part of this perspective is the presumption that government is supposed to ensure our presumed freedoms, like the, the freedom to be unthankful, the freedom to lie, the freedom to deceive and to be insincere, the freedom to complain, the freedom of religion so that we can worship distorted versions of ourselves, the freedom to deny our creator on the basis of the religion of evolution. The generation of my grandmother saw the introduction of government entitlements, such as Medicare, Social Security, unemployment insurance. Now, th these are very powerful benefits and very helpful and not certainly not to be denied. But these advantages are now considered entitlements, something that is our right and not our conditional privilege, something to be demanded, but not something for which we are expected to be thankful. It's our right, our due. After all, those, those words, please and thank you, that just a couple of generations ago were extremely common, now qualify as an endangered species in relation to society's vocabulary. So we're considering God's perspective on the principle of thankfulness, which we have to understand will be dramatically different from society from what scripture repeatedly refers to as the sons of men, as opposed to the sons of God. That kingdom law that God declares he will magnify and make honorable for his righteousness sake when he dramatically and powerfully ends his self-imposed silence certainly addresses this principle of thankfulness. There were six basic altar offerings that the people of God were required to offer at that Christ altar, a burnt offering, during that first kingdom age under kingdom law. Let's think in terms of the restored kingdom that we so desperately hope to inherit. As God will do in that millennial kingdom, let's magnify that law in our own understanding. Let's plumb the honor in that law that God will highlight in the approaching restoration of the kingdom of God. Now, just as a side note, if you truly have a goal of witnessing the honor of our Creator in those kingdom laws from the first kingdom age, I can recommend reviewing the series of uh, 85 articles entitled Vocational Training for an Immortal Priesthood. These were um, seven plus years of articles published in the Logos magazine from 2008 to 2015. And you can read them for free, all at the, the Spirit Sword Net, uh, dot net website, under that menu title of Vocational Training for an Immortal Priesthood. That series demonstrates the honor and the glory that is hidden in kingdom law and provides a foundational education in the law that Christ and the immortalized saints will be teaching as priests and police as kings in the approaching new and restored kingdom age. <coughs> These uh, six altar offerings were the burnt offering, the peace offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, uh, the meal or grain offering, and the drink offering. We are providing a foundational understanding as one division of these six offering categories demonstrated our current focus of thanksgiving. So let's review the basics and then focus in on that thanksgiving offering. These six primary altar offerings did have offering subdivisions and even different possible animal and agricultural components. 
Uh, the sin offering had six different offering categories, depending on one's social and religious status. The burnt offering could be different animals, but was always accomplished, uh, accompanied <clears throat> by the bread and the wine offerings, uh, more commonly referred to as the meat offering, but in some translations as the grain offering. The Hebrew word was minka, uh, indicating that grain, um, and sometimes can just be food, reference food. Uh, there were three possible offering conditions for this grain offering. There was the bare, unprocessed grain, the, the grain kernels. Secondly, there was crushed grain, which, of course, was fine flour. Thirdly, there was unleavened bread. Uh, while leavened bread was a component of the peace offering, it was never, ever to be offered on the Christ altar, simply consumed by the priests and the offerer, uh, but never, ever added to the flames of the Christ altar for divine acceptance. <coughs> now, we have noted previously how there were exactly 12 different offering categories that were burned to the honor of Yahweh. And 12 is the number of the saints, not the number of the enlightened community, but particularly the number of the saints, as we've already reviewed in this series of classes. This point of review is just for the emphasis of significance in relation to the specific Thanksgiving offering division of the peace offering. This 12 offerings observation forms a shadow framework for the divinely accepted behavior goals of those who will be chosen from among the enlightened community to become saints. This is why we see those 12 blood applications in the three progressive stations of the sin offering for the high priest and secondly for the nation at the veil when the altar of incense uh, and then the the altar of incense and then the altar of burnt offering and also why we noted the 12 steps in the three morning and evening rituals of each day during the first kingdom age performed at those three stations those seven lamps being refueled, those four incense ingredients being burned, and then that whole burnt offering on the Christ altar of burnt offering. We have these 12 offering categories of the male bovine, the bullock, uh, the male goat, the female goat, uh, the male and female sheep, the pigeon, the turtle dove, and then, of course, the female bovine, that red heifer, whose ashes cleanse from the physical defilement of death. In addition to those eight, we have the four divisions of bloodless, agriculturally sourced offerings. The bare, unprocessed kernels of grain, the fine flour, the unleavened bread, and then the drink offering, which was described as wine. There is quite a range of patterns and patterns within patterns in these 12 categories of offerings to God which again justifies the significance of considering the specific value of each of the six basic altar offerings. The Thanksgiving offering <clears throat> was one of the three subdivisions um, of the peace offering. Uh, a number of classes ago, <clears throat> we considered the difference between the burnt offering and the peace offering. This is when we were considering how to balance the two principles of truth and love. We determined from God's testimony that there are, that these are the two behavioral responses that God intended from those shadow patterns of these two altar offerings. The love and truth understanding is, of course, spelled out in Hosea 6 and 6 where God says, I did, for I desired mercy and not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Now, as we've noted before, the Hebrew word translated mercy is kesed, indicating a mercy generated from love, as opposed to simply empathy, or even mercy springing from bribery or some other form of personal advantage. The Hebrew noun translated as sacrifice is zabak, and does not indicate 
offerings in general, but specifically the peace offering. So the divine testimony declares God wanted merciful love, and not more peace offerings. And then he wanted the knowledge of God, and not more burnt offerings. God wanted the substance of love and truth, as opposed to the mechanical educational shadow rituals of the peace offering and the burnt offering. <clears throat> so, as we, as we drill down into the thanksgiving offering, one of those three divisions of the peace offering from which God expected loving mercy, we should recall some of the basic points of significance and relationships between these truth and love altar offerings. These review, base, these review observations are intended to further validate the significance of that thanksgiving offering, that division of the peace offering in the context of the behavior of those who will become the immortal priests, those the immortal saints, in just a few years from now. That first application of the consistent double twelve pattern, uh, as there will be two immortalization of the saints, two sets of twelve, that are presented in the shadow rituals of that first kingdom of God. One validating distinction of these truth and love altar offerings was that these were the only two altar offerings ever recorded as being accepted by God directly through a fire sent from heaven. This miraculous demonstration of divine acceptance was exclusive to the burnt and peace offerings. There were several significant occasions, including the, the ordina ordination of the priesthood at Sinai, at the beginning of the kingdom of God. Another occasion was at Jerusalem, at the point where the angel destroying Jerusalem paused. Um, there was This was the, the threshing uh, floor of Aruna, the Jebusite, and it was also Mount Moriah, where Abraham had been sent by God to offer Isaac as a sacrifice to God. David purchased that threshing floor, and the threshing instruments, and the oxen threshing the wheat, he immediately prepared burnt and peace offerings to God, which were miraculously incinerated by fire from heaven, stopping the plague. We read about this in First Chronicles chapter 21. It says, So David gave to Ornan for the place 600 shekels of gold by weight, and David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, and called upon the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offering. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheath thereof. There are a number of details about this incident that serve as exclamations of significance, and particularly to ourselves at this exact point in the unfolding plan of God. We read that Ornan was threshing wheat. That identifies the time frame for this incident as about the time of the Feast of Weeks, as that was the harvest feast identified by the wheat harvest. In uh, Exodus um, chapter 34, <clears throat> where it describes the details of the requirements for the Feast Weeks, God says, you shall observe the Feast of Weeks, of the first fruits of wheat harvest, and the Feast of Ingathering at the year's end, which of course refers to the Feast of Tabernacles. We have noted previously in this series of classes how the three harvest feast weeks serve as shadow prophecies of the three divine harvests of God, which are the harvest uh, or immortalization of Jesus the harvesting of the first set of saints at the beginning of the millennial kingdom, and the harvesting of the second set of saints in that eighth divine day after the conclusion of the millennial kingdom. Therefore, the second feast, that wheat harvest, should be understood as a shadow representation of the substance of the salvation event in which we personally hope 
to participate. Despite this understanding not being the dominant understanding in our enlightened community currently, um, it is fairly easy to validate conclusively through one of the kingdom parables of Jesus. <clears throat> this is the parable of the wheat and the tares. Jesus defines the kingdom in the context of the wheat harvest and parallels the separation of the wheat from the tares as the judgment process of the enlightened community and the storing of the wheat in the barn as the salvation of the faithful, the saints. Therefore, Jesus identifies that second immortalization event, the one we hope to participate in in the near future, to the Feast of Weeks, the wheat harvest. A possible objection to this understanding is how the Feast of Weeks was also defined as a feast of first fruits. But just like the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that began over seven weeks before, um, which was a Feast of First Fruits as well. While we can easily identify Jesus as being the first fruits of God from the grave, um, this is also true of the first set of saints. Um, Jesus isn't the only first fruits. Uh, the first set of Saints, to be immortalized, are also defined as the first fruits, but in a slightly different context. Um, in, this is in Revelation 14, uh, in a vision of the Millennial Kingdom, and they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts, or creatures, living creatures, and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000 which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. Jesus was the first fruits to God, but the first set of saints will be the first fruits to both God and Jesus Christ. There are a number of other ways to identify the Feast of Weeks, that wheat harvest, with the second divine harvesting event, the th second immortalization of the three in God's plan. But our goal at this time is simply to create the framework of this incident where God sends fire from heaven to consume the burnt and peace offerings at this specific place. This, of course, will be the exact place on Mount Moriah, where the son of David would construct the temple, Solomon's temple, would be the second of the four divinely designed sanctuaries by God. This, too, is a shadow projection of the second of the four salvation events in the Creator's plan. The first three salvation events are for people, but the fourth salvation event is for all of creation. When that last enemy death is completely eliminated from all of creation. Therefore, that second divine sanctuary, Solomon's Temple, just like the second harvest feast week, is a shadow projection of the second salvation event, the one in which we particularly hope to participate. Another interesting observation is what prompted this plague. David numbered Israel now, this was not a sin in and of itself. Uh, within kingdom law, there was an accommodation for a census to be taken. But there was a very significant control issue that was required to be observed in order to avoid a plague. There is no record of that tax being required in David's census in the accounts in either First Chronicles or Second Samuel. This was the census tax of a half shekel. Additionally, this tax was one of several bloodless atonement offerings that were provided for an atonement. In um, Exodus chapter 30, <coughs> we read, <coughs> And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, When you take the sum of the children of Israel after their number, then shall they give every man a ransom for his soul unto the Lord, when you number them, that there be no plague among them. 
when you number them. This they shall give. Everyone that passes among them that are numbered half a shekel. After the shekel of the sanctuary, a second shekel is twenty gerahs, and half shekel shall be the offering of the Lord. Every one that passes among them that are numbered from twenty years old and above shall give an offering unto the Lord. The rich shall not give more, the poor shall not give less than half a shekel. When they give an offering unto the Lord to make an atonement for their your souls. And you shall take the atonement money of the children of Israel, and shall appoint it for the service of the tabernacle of the congregation, that it may be a memorial unto the children of Israel before the Lord to make an atonement for your soul. This half-shekel census tax was not the only bloodless atonement offering under kingdom law. There was the ephah of fine flour that could be offered for a sin offering for the financially destitute in Israel. This flower provided an atonement. There was also the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement that was set free uh, into the wilderness, alive and not executed. Uh, and that, too, is expressed as providing an atonement. Again, <clears throat> again, we are anticipating and hoping to participate in that next atonement event when the first set of saints will be covered or atoned with the divine nature. What Paul refers to as the tabernacle made in heaven without hands that Jesus brings to us to clothe us so that we will no longer be naked before God. A procedure he defines as mortality being swallowed up of life. Paul also defines this immortalization experience as an atonement in an, in an atonement context when he says mortal will put on immortality to be covered or atoned with immortality and corruptible putting on incorruption so the prompt is that this miraculous divine acceptance of the combination burnt offering and peace offering by fire sent from heaven should have a great significance to ourselves particularly. In addition to the burnt and peace offerings that were consumed by fire from heaven, at the ordination of the priests in that first kingdom age at the beginning, which of course we hope to serve as the priest kings under Christ during the restored kingdom age. We need to remember a couple of other issues in the context of the partnering of the burnt and peace offering. First, <coughs> The bread and wine offerings always accompanied the burnt offering, but never the sin and trespass offerings. The bread and wine altar offerings are the only two of the six altar offerings that continued to be observed in the ritual application during the kingdom, uh, dur during the ecclesial age when the kingdom age ended. And secondly, uh, the um, the order of these offerings was always the burnt offering um, as the foundation and the peace offering on top of the burnt offering. In Leviticus chapter 3, we read, And Aaron's sons shall burn it, referring to the zivat, the peace offering, uh, on the altar upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It's an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. And if his offering for a sacrifice of peace uh, offering, <coughs> sorry, and if his sac offering for a sacrifice of peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. Since the burnt offering and the peace offering were the truth and love offerings, this order declares that knowledge has to be the foundation for love. Love cannot exceed or be the foundation for knowledge. But that's the challenge that we face in this last generation of the ecclesial age, in our own enlightened community. There is an endless agenda for promoting love over knowledge. This is evidenced in the frequent disrespect for fellowship distinctions, maintaining that fellowship distinctions are just unloving. But 
Actually, that demonstrates an imbalancing of love, in addition to a disrespect for spiritual knowledge, those terms of God's righteousness, his rightness. That issue of dismissing truth in favor of love diminishes the love of God beneath the love of each other, which is dead wrong. In our last class, we considered a couple of examples of the hidden glory of God that can only be witnessed at this time before the restoration of the kingdom of God if we first correctly understand the terms of God's righteousness. In other words, on the basis of knowledge, love without knowledge will never see that hidden glory in the parallel design of the wilderness encampment and the creator's design of the universe. Love, without knowledge, would never witness that hidden glory in the very extensive pattern of seven and eight that radiates out from the two resurrections of Jesus Christ. One of the primary themes we promoted in these classes from more than a year now is understanding the significance of balance. If we elevate love above knowledge, we've already lost our spiritual balance. That's the reverse of the divine pattern of the burnt offering and the peace offering, elevating love above truth. That imbalancing of spiritual priorities blinds us to that hidden glory of God. We will not have those eyes that see and ears that hear <clears throat> that Jesus insists we develop. But that is impossible if we exalt love over knowledge and the love of people above the love of God. Love is absolutely important, as we are emphasizing in the significance of the peace offering. But love has to be constrained by knowledge, just as our hearts have to be circumcised by that two-edged sword of truth, if we're ever going to witness and eventually experience that glory of God. So, with this framework, for recognizing the significance of the peace offering, let's consider those three peace offering divisions, and particularly the greatest of them all, the thanksgiving offering. In Leviticus <coughs> excuse me, chapter 7, we'll read several verses, and this is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which he shall offer unto the Lord. If he offer it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mingled with fire and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mingled with oil and fi of fine flour fried. Besides the cakes, he shall offer for his offering leavened bread with the sacrifice of thanksgiving of his peace offerings. Of course, that was not put on the altar. That was simply consumed. And the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offering for thanksgiving shall be eaten the same day that it is offered. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering be a vow or a voluntary offering, the three divisions, it shall be eaten the same day that he offers his sacrifice, and on the morrow shall also the remainder of it shall be eaten, but the remainder of the flesh of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burnt with fire. And if any of the flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings be eaten at all, on the third day, it shall not be accepted. Neither shall it be imputed unto him that offers it. It shall be an abomination. And the soul that eats of it shall bear his iniquity. We have one more condition to reference in relation to these three divisions of the peace offering. This is the degree of blemishes that would be permitted. The thanksgiving and the votive divisions of the peace offering had to be completely blemish-free. But, the free will offering animal could have certain blemishes. We read this um, in uh, Leviticus chapter 3. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And then also in Leviticus 22, we have this exception. Either a bullock or a lamb that has anything superfluous or lacking in his parts, that mayest thou offer for a free will offering. 
but for a vow it shall not be accepted. So we can certainly see a descending order of restrictions in these three divisions of the peace offering, the love offering. The thanksgiving offering <coughs> has the most restrictions requiring a completely blemish-free condition for the sacrificial animal, as well as being limited to being eaten on exclusively the first day after the offering is made. Now, I'm a person that is familiar with fire roasting an entire animal, well, at least a dressed, a dressed carcass of an animal. Um, even a fairly small animal offers a lot of meat to consume. So a one-day consumption of a peace offering is going to ordinarily see a great deal of leftovers that God absolutely forbid to be eaten after just one day, if that offering qualified. It's a Thanksgiving offering. When all you have to eat is manna, destroying all that leftover meat should have made a, a potentially educational impression the votive offering permitted the officiating priest and the offering party to eat that animal on the second day in addition to the first day. This restriction relaxation, however, was not duplicated with the demand for a blemish-free animal offering. The peace offering for a vow still required a blemish-free animal. The free will offering still limits consumption to two days, but does permit a less restricting demand for being blemish-free. So, what we see is a descending significance, as greater and greater restrictions indicates greater significance. The greatest of the three peace offering divisions was the thanksgiving offering validated by its greatest restrictions. Next was the peace offering for the performance of vows, and thirdly was the free will offering. This layered structure and framework for our understanding of the ritual of the thanksgiving offering and the peace offering and how it blends with all the other offerings, and particularly the burnt offering, will provide us with some valuable understandings about the divine principle of thankfulness that is so disrespected in the societies of the sons of men in this generation. Building up and out from these foundational understandings is going to be our starting point in our next class.